Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about defensive driving or what I like to call proactive driving. Because you're not being defensive, sometimes you're actually being aggressive, getting on the throttle, but you're being proactive. And the most important component of being proactive is controlling space around your vehicle, particularly in front of your vehicle. And despite what people think, contrary to what they think, that if you keep space around your vehicle that you're going to uh, you know, not use road uh, roads to their capacity, it's completely the opposite. Actually, if we kept space between our vehicles, in fact, we would be able to have more capacity in our roadways because what happens is, is vehicles get too close to each other and then one vehicle has an effect on all of the rest of the vehicles and then you get these phantom traffic jams that happen out on our interstates and freeways. And this is what's going to happen is everybody is bunched up together. In fact, if we kept space, we would actually reduce congestion in our urban centers. So proactive driving, defensive driving, that's what we're talking about tonight. We're going to do that to help you keep safe because for new drivers, we're now talking about the hundredth, hundred deadliest days of the year. And I talked about this last year or last week, previous uh, live presentations here about the fact that Summertime is when the most number of crashes happen. Summertime, not wintertime, not the fall, not the spring, not when it's bad weather, foggy, raining, those types of things. Summertime, good roads, clear days, uh, not very far from home, those types of things, that's when most of them happen. So Memorial Day weekend in the United States to Labor Day weekend, 30% of fatal traffic crashes amongst young people is when they happen 30 percent so 100 days of the year 30 percent of the traffic crashes happen now that math doesn't work very well because i just figured that out in my head uh it's about 30 percent of the year but 30 percent of traffic fatalities happen during these 100 days so keep yourself safe you know you're gonna have your friends in the car and those types of things know that things are going to happen so we're going to revisit that we're going to keep you safe uh give you some skills and strategies to be a safer smarter driver Corey's here. Corey is the moderator. Brooks for Wheels uh, keeps does a great job of getting up the videos I suggest you have a look at for further detail on the questions you ask. Retired here, my friend Marion, KGB from uh, Ajax, Ontario. Uh, Marion tuning in from Port Moody. Uh, Sean tuning in from Brooklyn Park. Elevator fan from Monticello, Indiana. So lots and lots of people here. Uh, Hi is here as well <laughs> from the Maritimes. And my friend Mallory is here from the Mal uh, from the Maritimes as well. And I hope that everybody in the Maritimes is safe because they have a wildfire down there uh, burning out of control. So stay safe. And if there are roads that are closed during forest fires, because we have forest fire season out here on the West Coast where I live, uh, we get forest fires in August. If there is closed roads or it's smoky or those types of things, do not drive into that area. Okay, stop, find another route, go another direction because... Forest fires create their own winds and they will go in the direction that they determine that they want to go in. So stay out of them. Elevator fan, there were at least uh, three left lane squatters on the way to and from Indianapolis. And one of them was uh, didn't get pulled over when there was a police officer nearby. Yeah, that's unfortunate that people sit in a left lane lane. It's just the reality of our driving. Social driving is what we call it. The problems we face when we're driving. So uh, you're just tuning in. You're watching on the replay. Uh, click that like button, tell us where you're from, ask us any questions you have about driving, passing a driver's test, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. We can help you with all of that. Uh, Marion, that video you sent me was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you so much. Awesome. So glad we could help out Marion. Uh, Marion was having some questions about adjusting her seat and uh, nine steps to setting up the car. If you haven't had a look at that video, uh, Corey will put that up for you. And you can have a look at that. It shows you how to set up the seat for maximum comfort and control. Because remember, if you're not in the driver's seat, it's pretty tough to drive the control drive the car. So the other reason for setting up the seat correctly is that if something goes wrong and you're in an emergency situation and you need to manipulate the steering wheel, the brake, and the and the accelerator, you need to be in the driver's seat. So we have the seat belt. <laughs> seat properly adjusted and the dead pedal which is the resting place on the left of the footwell where you can put your foot and you can push yourself back into the driver's seat in the event of an emergency adopted from racing julio tuning in from pennsylvania sebastian hello des moines iowa 
Uh, Ray, I remember the night before my driving test. I frantically skimmed through these videos just to keep everything fresh in my mind. Awesome. Uh, Colton is tuning in from Arkansas there in the U.S. And Ben uh, from Fiji will taking my test on the 20th of June. Please help me out. Uh, ben will do all we can to help you be successful on passing your driver's test there uh, in Fiji. Awesome. Uh, and Pat says that uh, he or she has their driver's tests uh, next week. And I'm not going to go assume because remember the old SNL <laughs> Saturday Night Live skit with Pat. Nobody could figure out whether it was a woman or a man. And uh, when I can't see you... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ace Double, if I drive to a stop sign and another car pulls up to the stop sign and it is turning, who has the right of way? Okay, so straight through traffic, overturning traffic. So it's basically straight through traffic, overturning traffic, right turning traffic, over left turning traffic. And Corey will put up the videos for you on stop signs and all of that will help you out. Uh, retired, I'm not a ma fan of driving in the rain on the highway, but your video on driving in the rain is a big help. Awesome, 2019. And as long as it's not raining crazy, I enjoy driving in the rain. I do find it exceptionally challenging, and I'm sure most other people do, is driving at night in the rain, especially when you're in the city, because you get so much glare off the water on the road from all of the residual lights, and it just is really overwhelming when you're trying to drive at night in the rain. But out on the highway, you know, windshield wipers going, sometimes it's just you know, tune out, have a good story on the, uh, an audio book on or a podcast or something like that. And you just get out and drive in the rain for hours and hours and hours. Uh, Mallory, hot and dry weather out here is not helping with the forest fires. Yeah. Same thing with what's going on in Alberta, Canada here, uh, with the hot, dry weather. It is definitely not helping with the forest fires for sure. Uh, Pat, I'm really bad at right of way at four way stop signs, intersections. Okay. So Pat, what I suggest to you is if you're having challenges at four-way stop sign intersections, go down to a four-way stop sign intersection and watch the traffic for 10 or 15 minutes. I know it's not sexy. It's not, it's not sexy at all. But if you're having difficulty figuring out where uh, all of that is, right of rules, who goes first, whose turn it is, uh, go down when it's busy and you'll be able to sort that out, I guarantee you, within 10 or 15 minutes, all right? My friend Rob is here. Uh, earbuds help best. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Rob, I got my book finished, finally. I'm going to send you a copy of it to have a look at it and let me know what you think. And, you know, if anybody else wants to have a look at it, uh, I'm going to launch it here in a couple of weeks. And what I'm going to do is, uh, for the first 100 people, if you can leave me a review, you will get a free copy of Driving Test Secrets. So, look for that. I'll start sending out messages and uh information about that and that will really help you out my friend tim is here drive smart bc if you are in the province of british columbia and want to know anything about policing court cases traffic road engineering road maintenance uh, government issues what they're dealing with those types of things then definitely check out drive smart bc here in the province of british columbia excellent excellent information over there at his website as well he has a forum you can engage in conversation and discussion with other authorities and experts on the topic so check out drive smart bc if you are in the province of british columbia uh yes we'll definitely do that awesome tyler uh maintaining safe following distance or safely passing vehicles help prevent accidents but also road rage yes indeed my friend yes indeed space keep that space around your vehicle protect it as if your life depends on it because it could potentially depend on it uh, Sebastian, it's raining in Iowa, and I will be driving tonight to deliver in 10 different towns tonight. Be safe, my friend. Uh, good windshield wipers, good tires on your vehicle. Uh, check your windshield wipers. Make sure that you have good windshield wipers. I, Corey will put up the video for you. Triforce, Triforce, Tri, Tri, Trico. That's it. Trico windshield wipers. Uh, I have a video on Trico windshield wipers. I recommend them, and I put them on the buggy some years ago. It was probably three, four years ago. We'll have a look at the date on the video. Those windshield wipers are still on the buggy. They do need to be replaced, but they're still working. They're still on the buggy. The reason they need to be need to be replaced is due to the fact that they're starting to squeak. They're making noise as they're using. But those windshield wipers have three, four years of life in them, so have a check at that. Uh, all right, uh, Rob, we'll definitely be promoting your book to my driving school and students after I read it. Awesome. Uh, definitely have a look at it, Rob. Any feedback, any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. But I think, 
I'm pretty happy. I'm very well. No, I'm very happy with the end product. I've sent it to an editor. I've sent it to a proofreader. I'm not one of those people that tries to just get something out there. No, it's it's <laughs> it's been a lot longer than I had initially imagined. But usually books are like that. Uh, Marion, will you have the books at the chapters or it is online on your site? Uh, Marion, it'll be available on Amazon and it'll be available over on my website as well. So look for that. And like I said, I'll send out an email letting everybody know, but I'm hoping that I'm going to get it up by the 15th of June. Okay. That's my date. That's my date right now. Uh, Colton, why don't more car manufacturers engineer their cars like they're going to be driven on the Autobahn? Cars engineered for that are more enjoyable on the road trips. Uh, Colton, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, Tracy has an Audi S4 and yes, <laughs> it is a beautiful car to drive on the highway. Absolutely no doubt. Sebastian, I'll be driving in a semi-truck to deliver in 10 different towns in Iowa. Okay, right. My apologies, Sebastian. I forgot about that. Uh, yes, but definitely check your windshield wipers on the semi truck there. Uh, tires are given. You're going to be fine. You're going to be great. Uh, Michael, to take my permit test this Friday. Good luck on that. And we're back, it looks like. Okay. Excellent connection. All right, we're back. Here we go. All right, we'll get back to the beginning here. Bear with me. All right, so we're talking about smarter, smarter, not smarter, smarter, smarter defensive driving. We had some technical issues there. Uh, bear with me. Minimum safe distance. We want to have a minimum safe distance when we're driving. And I call it minimum safe distance because think of it like nuclear war or hand grenades or any other explosion. We want to have minimum safe distance between our vehicle and between other vehicles for when we make mistakes and when other road users on the roadway make mistakes. This is why we want to maintain a minimum safe distance. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s hauling freight between Ontario, Canada and the United States, the lower 48, mostly the eastern seaboard. I did make it out to the western states, but mostly up and down New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, uh, West Virginia, Florida, those types of places. Uh, when I was in Australia, living in Australia during the early 2000s, I drove a bus for Greyhound, one of the regional bus lines. Uh, one of the other plans uh, this year is to go to Australia in the fall, and I'm going to shoot a bunch of videos in Australia. So I'll be driving on the left side of the road and giving you information about how to pass a driver's test in, the United, in Australia, not in the United States. Okay, everything on the channel is about the United States. Became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1998, uh, doctorate in legal history with a specialty in policing and traffic. Uh, my expertise is legal history, which is a study of policing courts and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. If you want to know more about me, you can read the complete autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. And this year we're going to hit 300,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel, which is wildly, wildly more successful than I ever imagined this was going to be. So really good, good stuff. Okay, new driver defensive driving, have a look at that uh, podcast over at the Smart Drive Test website as well. You can find the link down in the description there. And the real learning begins for new drivers who just got their license and are driving on their own. So have a look at those two uh, sources of information to keep yourself safe after you get your uh, license there. All right, so what is driving? Driving is both an art and a science. We have to observe, we have to manage our, our space and observation in predicting traffic patterns and understanding what individual road users are doing on the roadway is a bit of an art. You gotta kind of figure out what people are doing. And I was following a van this morning down the hill coming back into town and they were weaving all over the road. They were in the other lane. At one point I thought they were gonna hit the concrete barrier, which I would have thought would have been exceptionally funny because it was very obvious that they were trying to, to text on their phone while they were driving. And I thought that that would have been good karma for them to run into the barrier. So we were up very early. Of course, there's very little traffic on the roadway. And this is often the time that you're gonna get into trouble when there's very little traffic on the roadway, six, you know, five or six o'clock in the morning. And these other goofy people are thinking, oh, there's no traffic on the roadway. I think I'll just take a call or I'll text or those types of things. So be aware of what other people are doing. Uh, to drive well, we must have calm awareness. We must always, always be observing, looking, 
scanning, shoulder checking, shoulder checking, shoulder checking. Uh, bonnet to boot or nose to tail kind of thing, which is the way that we drive. So we have rudimentary uh, com uh, communication between different vehicles and road users. And a lot of people say, oh, we need yellow turn signals on the rear of cars for better communication. Uh, I somewhat agree, but really, if you really think about it, turn signals are the last kind of ditch attempt to communicate to other traffic that you're in fact going to change directions of your vehicle because we don't really pay attention to uh, turn signals. It's all of the other things that the driver's doing. They're in the right turning lane. They're coming up to the, the slip lane. They're engaging in the slip lane. They've moved their vehicle to the right side of the lane and those types of things. The position of the vehicle communicates intent much more than signals do because we're really not looking at signals anyway when we're driving. You should be taking a holistic approach to traffic when you're driving. All right, so scope three, smarter defensive driving. The first thing that we do is we define the problem of driving, social driving. And there are people who come on here and they say, oh my God, when I try and change lanes and I put my signal on, the car beside me speeds up and tries to cut me off. No, if the car beside you speeds up, they're actually doing you a favor because they're getting out of the way. But one and the same time, that's off-putting for new drivers because they think the other driver is being rude or being aggressive when in fact you put your signal on and now they're just moving out of your way okay drivers will not come to a stop sign drivers rarely signal when they're changing directions this is all just part and parcel of social driving it's all part and parcel of the problems that we have with driving all right so the tools to deal with smarter defensive driving are space management communication, speed management, and observation. These are the four tools that I'm gonna talk about and I'm gonna talk about for the remainder of the hour uh, to keep you safe when you're driving, especially during the next 100 days of summertime when new drivers are at the highest risk of being involved in a crash. Living room, you wanna create space in front of your vehicle and you wanna maintain that space at all costs. You are always, always gonna be able to control that space in front of your vehicle. Uh, if you aren't near anything, any other road users or fixed objects, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. And so many people, we've all heard the saying, there's never enough time. There's never enough time. Speed is comprised of two components, distance over time. If you control distance, if you control space in front of your vehicle, now you have more time. If you have more time, now you can contemplate options when you get into an emergency situations and those options are going to keep you safe it's as tim said from drive smart bc space equals time when things go wrong you need to see decide and avoid or as i say i say you need to have the attention you need to get attention to what's going on you need to assess what's going on and you need to take some sort of action so attention assessment action that's what you need to do when you get into a situation where things could potentially go sideways on the roadway. Stay back one vehicle length from traffic in front of you when you're at a traffic light. And there are so many reasons to do this. And I know, again, the people will say, oh, you're not using the road to its capacity. Actually, we're increasing the capacity of traffic flow through that intersection if everybody stayed back one vehicle length. First and foremost, it will prevent you being rear-ended because you're sitting there calm awareness you're looking in the center mirror you're watching traffic come up behind you and if the traffic is careening up behind you and they're not slowing down you can start tapping on your brake lights flashing your lights and you can be moving forward a little bit oftentimes that strategy will prevent you from being rear-ended now keep in mind rear-ended in the united states of america the number one reported insurance claim is rear-end collisions even more so than windshield damage so it is the number one crash you are going to get rear-ended other reasons for staying back, you can move out and around if the vehicle in front of you breaks down. If the vehicle in front of you rolls back because they're driving a manual transmission, they're not gonna roll into the front of you. And then in an ideal world of my utopia, if everybody stayed back one vehicle length, the whole pack could move off together instead of the first car going and the second car going and the third car going. Now, one other piece of information, if you're the first car in the queue at the traffic light and the light turns green, do not go right away. <laughs> pause scan the intersection because it's often within the two seconds after the light changes that some knucklehead runs the red light and t-bones you so before going at a green light because we keep in mind a green light means go if the way is clear so pause 
left center right scan the intersection and then proceed because people run the light two seconds after the light changes okay out on the highway drive between the clusters do not drive in the clusters of vehicles okay you can see the cluster in the image here down on the right and if you drive on the highway for any length of time you are going to be seeing those clusters of people that just insist on driving together in big groups they they think they're in nascar or something that they're drafting and are going to save fuel okay so you can always control space in front uh, use cruise control set your cruise control to keep yourself out of the clusters and speed management will allow you to control space and most of the time you're going to be able to keep up with traffic flow if you just time it you know one or two miles an hour over the traffic flow or below the traffic flow on cruise control that's going to allow you to drive between the clusters on the highway okay who's driving following too close if you're following too close you're giving up the power of your vehicle because you're not driving your vehicle now you're being reactionary and in being reactionary you're probably also going to be retaliatory because you think that the person in front of you is driving too slow and by following them too close and tailgating you're communicating to them that they're in fact driving too slow and that they should speed up when in fact you're hoping on a wing and a prayer that if they do something goofy as one comment left on a, on a question I asked about when you use your hazard lights uh, the person said yeah if somebody drives up too close at night and they got their headlights shining through the back window I flip on the high on my uh, four-way flashes and I let off the throttle I'm like yeah that's like one step away from brake checking somebody so please don't do that and understand that other people are going to do things that are unpredictable and they're going to be retaliatory so keep yourself safe and be as predictable as possible predict traffic patterns looking ahead at controlled intersections scanning the intersection and i saw this today on a left hand turn the pedestrians are crossing and the person is making a left hand turn and they are sitting with their nose right at the edge of the crosswalk and it just that just irks me to no end and if i had been one of the past one of the pedestrians trying to cross the road i would have been banging on his hood because it just really frustrates me there's you know, when I'm in my car, I'm pretty good when I'm driving. There's little, very little road rage. But when I'm on my bicycle or I'm a pedestrian, <laughs> I go from zero to a thousand when people threaten my safety on the road. All right, so turning lanes, watching for turning lanes, looking for rubberneckers and out of the ordinary, uh, knowing char characteristics of vehicles and road users, motorcycles, pickup trucks and caravans, camper trailers, those types of things, RV drivers, all that stuff is coming out now in the summertime, okay? Spring motorcycles in the summer, it's RV units, and in the wintertime, it's going to be snowmobiles and pickup trucks with utility trailers with snowmobiles on them and those types of things. Uh, just a minute, elevator fan, I'll get to that as soon as I finish up the presentation here. Okay, interpret the actions of individual road users. Look farther down the road. Interpret vehicles movement. Okay, so if you're coming into this construction zone here, you know that vehicles are going to be merging over to the left. And there are going to be some goofy people who are going to do the zipper merge and they're going to wait right to the choke point before they merge over. Okay, do not zipper merge. It's not safe. Okay, do not leave your defensive driving your proactive driving down to the last minute and a hope on a wing and a prayer that some other person on the highway is not is going to let you in because he or she may not let you in because they're just having a bad day and uh, when they dumped the cream in their milk this morning it was sour and now they're just upset at the rest of the world so don't zip emerge okay get over as early as you can keep yourself safe okay maintain your space buffer in front of your vehicle if the traffic is moving slow always maintain that one vehicle length between your vehicle and the vehicles in front all right mapping intersections and tracking road users okay 40 percent of crashes happen at intersections 25 percent of fatalities on our roadways are vulnerable road users motorcycle riders uh, cyclists pedestrians it is at intersections that you are most likely to encounter these vulnerable road users so scan map track take note of where these road users are going if there's a potential that they're going to cross your path of travel keep track of them all right if you're making left hand turns as the knucklehead today okay watch the pedestrians on the cross street so that you can stay back and move into the intersection only after the way is clear and then you can proceed good luck on your driver's test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer all right sorry about the technical difficulty we were having there during 
at the beginning of the presentation. Not sure what happened, but I looked over and my streaming software was all frozen. And I was like, you know, you got, it, it never freezes when you're looking really awesome, right? It always freezes with some weird look on your face and it's all contorted. And you're like, oh my God, who is that person? All right. Uh, yes. And then pull in front of them and then jump on their brakes to make that vehicle slow down in retaliation for something. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Marion. Brake checking. Yes, that's exactly what it means is that you cut somebody off or you did something that you may or may not even know that you did. Uh, and then they cut in front of you usually on a highway and then they just like nail the brakes and it's called brake checking and uh, it's not safe at all. It's incredibly unsafe and it's dangerous because most of the time they do it on interstates or freeways. Uh, the one I saw on Twitter a couple of weeks ago was a semi truck and there was a car trying to get in from the passenger side on the right side of the vehicle. They were trying to merge over. Well, the, the semi truck didn't let the vehicle in. So what happened was uh, the semi truck got going, the car got in behind the semi truck, got up past the semi truck and then trapped the semi truck on an off ramp. And on the off ramp, it was single lane. So the car just like, it didn't even brake check them. It just come up, brake checked them, came to a complete stop. The semi truck driver couldn't move around the car. And every time the semi truck went to move around the vehicle, the car would block him. So he, the car was essentially blocking. I mean, this was the ultimate road rage and ultimate uh, ticked off. And, you know, just, <laughs> I don't encourage anybody to do any of this. And it's incredibly dangerous because not only, you know, in many places do people have weapons in their vehicle, whatever that weapon may be, whether it's a gun or a tire iron or whatever, and they get out of your vehicle and they just start pounding on your vehicle. Your vehicle is a weapon and they just lose their mind and then they just drive into you and somebody gets hurt. So please don't do this stuff and don't engage in it. If somebody is, you know, cuts you off or does something else or flips you the bird or whatnot, just, you know, let them go and have their crash somewhere else. Don't engage because when you engage, it goes up this little bit more and then it goes up a little bit more and it goes up a little bit more and a little bit more. And then, you know, next thing you know, somebody's in the hospital or somebody's seriously seriously hurt and in jail for those things all right all uh, right i live right beside a busy street there's been at least two accidents within the last month or two and here there's at least 10 cars speeding past my house every day uh ray i hear you some of those intersections some of those streets are very prone to having traffic crashes and i lived on an intersection that had a two-way stop sign it was incredibly busy intersection lots of cars pulling out all day and in the very short few months that I lived there there were a couple of serious crashes there as well and of course because I'm living right on the corner I can see out the front window and see the intersection and often a couple of times during crashes I actually had to go out and help with you know because I was one of the first people on the scene helping people out now if you are involved in a crash and you pull over to stop for whatever reason before you get out of the vehicle this is common because you're in shock that you were just involved in a crash Make sure that before you get out of the car, you secure the car, put it into park, put the parking brake on. Otherwise you're gonna get out of the car and it's gonna start rolling away. And this is common amongst people who are involved in traffic crashes because they're in shock, okay? And they forget to secure the vehicle before they get out of it. So make sure you do that. Just like take a moment, breathe, secure the vehicle and then get out. Uh, presto, man, I'm realizing how bad I am at parking still. I uh, think also it might have to do with I realized how spoiled I am with backup cameras and parking sensors. Yes, presto. <laughs> yes, the technology is eroding our ability to drive. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And talking about technology eroding our ability to drive, one of the other pieces in all of this is that acceleration. So here, I was talking about this a couple of weeks ago. The 1968 Volkswagen Beetle had 68 horsepower. It had a 68 horsepower four-cylinder air-cooled engine, okay? So that was 1968, that was 50 years ago. Move up to 1998, a Honda CRV, my buggy, has 126 horsepower at 5,400 RPM. Well, I never run it at 5,400 RPM, and most of the time it's probably running about 100 horsepower. The 2023 Honda CRV, the same vehicle that I drive, now has a 1.5 liter four cylinder engine with 195 horsepower. It's a turbocharged 1.9 diesel or uh, turbocharged engine. 
and it's got some crazy amount of foot torque on it. So one of the things that we now have in all of these new vehicles is acceleration. Like we have all kinds of power and speed and we can go crazy, crazy fast on the highway. But I mean, the interesting thing is, I mean, the old buggy there will do 140, 150. It takes a long time for it to get up to that amount of speed and it won't stay there if there's any sort of grade or anything. But what of the things that we now have is that we have massive amounts of horsepower and massive amounts of acceleration off the line. So that is the other thing that's eroded our ability to drive because I drive the old buggy the way that I used to drive truck. I'm always scanning traffic ahead. I'm looking for openings and I'm trying to keep the momentum going in the vehicle so I don't have to come to a stop or slow down because when I slow down, it takes me a lot longer to get going <laughs> because I don't have that acceleration. I don't have that horsepower. So I'm always trying to figure out how to keep it moving like I did the old big trucks when I was driving semi trucks. So one of the other ways that technology has eroded our ability to drive and going back to what presto was saying in terms of backup cameras and sensors and those types of things we don't we don't have the skills that we once had because now we're relying on the technology to drive our vehicle for us uh colton uh elevator fan is it okay to use the horn to avoid a crash uh elevator fan i always say to my students that if you have time to use the horn you have time to avoid a crash okay uh, if you've got time to push that horn, you've got some time to do something else. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mallory, my mom and I were tailgated on the highway yesterday. That's unfortunate, but unfortunately, uh, Mallory, it's one of those things that's going to happen. As I said, if you are being tailgated on the highway, you're in the left-hand lane, move back over to the right-hand lane, you know, Increase your following distance in front of your vehicle so that you don't have to make aggressive movements on the brake and the throttle. And if there's some place safe to pull over and let the person pass, then pull over and let them pass and then carry on with your trip. Uh, yeah, but the new CRV weighs about 500 pounds more. Still, it moves much faster though than the old ones. Yes, which is crazy because, and on that note of what Presto just said about the new CRVs weighing about 500 pounds more, which is absolutely true because I was corrected on this some years ago. You know, you get the old vehicles from the 1970s and they look like these enormous, huge cars. And you think, oh my God, they weigh so much. <laughs> the vehicles today actually weigh more than the vehicles did in the 1960s and 1970s. The reason for that is because everything on these crazy vehicles is all power. Uh, and you have all these environmental controls and they're just, they're heavier. They're way heavier. And the other thing, presto, about the new CRVs, uh, they're probably, <laughs> it's probably a third bigger than the ones they were manufacturing in the 1998 and the first gen uh, CRVs. They're a lot bigger for sure. Uh, Tim says, my boss used to say that most drivers today put it in D for dumb and hit the gas. <laughs> yes. Yes, they do, Tim. And the other piece about it is, is that, you know, most of us are now driving automatic transmissions. And even if we are driving manual transmissions, uh, the new manual transmissions, I mean, the motors are all electronic fuel injection, so they, they rev up automatically as soon as you let the clutch out and hit the friction point. Uh, they have hill assist as well, and they're like super easy to drive, <laughs> right? It's not like the old buggy. It's uh, Tracy gets in it and she's just like, oh my God, it's like a full body workout driving this thing. <laughs> you got to be engaged when you're driving the old buggy. Uh, Epic, my friend, uh, another thing to consider is that four lane highways, you must be scanning frequently because there's no, uh, another way to pass vehicles ahead of you. Six or more find an empty lane to pass them back. And absolutely you get some of those crazy interstates, uh, some of those freeways around the big metropolitan cities in the United States there. It's huge, huge traffic. And usually what I tell people is to, you know, pick two lanes, drive in two lanes. So if it's four lanes, drive in the two right lanes and, you know, ideally the first one in that's your best defensive lane so drive in the second and third lane and that's going to keep be your best defensive posturing uh my friend close uh tesla is like two tons yes uh close uh you're talking about electric vehicles all of the electric vehicles are 40 percent heavier than their uh ice internal combustion engine counterparts ice we have all these terms now it's very cool <laughs> sounds very intellectual ice so yeah, the, all the electric vehicles are about 40% heavier. And I was reading an article the other day uh, that a driver training company was doing training for municipalities to 
try and prolong the life of the tires because one of the things these electric vehicles is doing is chewing through tires. So A, they're using them in the cities. They're using electric vehicles for municipalities in the cities. First and foremost, if anybody knows anything about semi-trucks and semi-trucks that do city work, every six months you're putting a set of tires, a set of steer tires on that semi-truck. And so electric vehicles are one and the same because you're always turning and maneuvering and manip manipulating the vehicle. It's very hard on the tires. Second, the extra weight, 40% more weight. And then third, they said, oh, you know, don't use the acceleration. It's like, why would I buy an electric vehicle if I don't get the acceleration off the line? <laughs> I want that instant torque. And they're saying the other reason that you're chewing through tires is because of the acceleration that you get with these electric vehicles. And that's absolutely right. If I'm driving an electric vehicle and, I, and the light goes green, boom, I'm going. <laughs> I got that torque. Uh, it's, you know, it's like giving me an Audi S4 with a V6 supercharger in it and telling me not to go. Right? It just begs to be driven because <laughs> that's the way it was designed. So, uh, you know, I left a comment and I said, you know, the driver training that they were proposing to then saying that it was the driver's fault that the cars were chewing through tires. I said, you know, this driver training sounds a lot like the emperor's new clothes. Very much like the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> and for those of you who are not familiar with the story of the emperor's new clothes, it's about a tailor that sells new clothes to the emperor and the emperor goes out on a parade and then everybody in the crowd realizes that the emperor doesn't in fact have new clothes. The emperor has in, in fact been sold, uh, you know, sold to by a phony and he's actually naked. He doesn't have any clothes on. <laughs> uh, young, 3PO, uh, personally I always pay attention to micro adjust the string wheel anyways. I don't trust it that much. Uh, yeah, in, and of course technology is coming along less and less, my friend. Uh, it's like getting an M5 with 600 horsepower and not being able to never enjoy the power. Absolutely, yeah. Why would you have an M5 with 600 horsepower? What fun is that? <laughs> KGB, with the level of auto thefts these days, do you feel it's valuable to have an anti-theft device installed on a vehicle? Uh, KGB, most vehicles are going to come with an anti-theft device. It depends what kind of vehicle you have. If you have, I know that a few years ago, the F-150, the Ford F-150 was the number one stolen vehicle. If you have one of those vehicles that is one of the number one stolen vehicles, then yes, I would probably get some sort of alarm put on it that would prevent it from being stolen. Otherwise, you know, I just don't know what you can do. Uh, you know, those bars that you put in the steering wheel, I forget what they're called. Uh, don't ever bother with one of those. First of all, they're dangerous because they're heavy. They weigh about 10 pounds. And most people take them off the steering wheel and they throw them down in the footwell, either in the front or in the back. And you've got this 10 pound piece of steel. If you get into any kind of a crash, it's all of a sudden now it's flying around inside the car and it's gonna hit you, which is incredibly dangerous. The other piece about these things, those steering wheel locks, they've done, <laughs> they've actually demonstrated that it takes it slows thieves down by about 20 seconds because simply what they do is it goes inside the steering wheel what thieves do is they bring a grinder with them and they cut the steering wheel and then they just pull it off and they throw it in the back <laughs> right so it's it, professional thieves it slows them down about 20 seconds so don't bother with one of those abul you are most welcome my friend uh ray i've driven a manual maybe once i got some what of a grasp but it was hard since it was basically a rally car with extremely sensitive throttle so it was hard to move the car from the biting point yeah and if you got one of those <laughs> really fast engines high throttles and those types of things yeah it's going to be a little tough to learn how to drive a manual transmission uh Evan, at a staggered intersection, if you were to turn left and then turn right, would you go directly into the right-hand lane to turn right? Uh, yes, you can, Evan. Uh, one of the videos that I wanted, that Corey, I'll put up for you is a video I did on turning left and then you're going to turn right immediately and showed you how to move across the lanes of traffic so that you could turn right. And there's a skill, a strategy of not a skill, but a sequence of a series of events that you put in place that you can do that. And that will have a look at that video. Cora put that up for you. Uh, Zad, uh, what about Hyundai Tucson? Uh, yeah, I've seen the Hyundai Tucson. They've been around for a long time now. Uh, have a look at the reviews here on Google. You know, just Google it. Look at the reviews. Look at how often it's... Uh, 
stolen and those types of things and that will definitely give you some information about whether you need to put a theft device on or those types of things uh klaus youtube is eating my comments <laughs> Rob said the same thing earlier that YouTube is eating comments today. I don't know, maybe you maybe the algorithm is hungry or something that it's eating comments here. Uh, <laughs> or possibly I'm missing comments because it's busy right now and there's a lot of comments here. So if I don't get to your comment, uh, leave a comment down in the comment section there and I'll definitely have a look at it and I'll get you an answer. We'll get you uh, some more information, details and help you out. Pass your driver's test first time over at the Smart Drive Test website. Check that out guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time as well we throw in as a bonus the winter and defensive driving smart courses have a look at that you can pick that up for about 38 dollars us uh colton here's an idea use a cheat code to activate the fuel pump just make sure the cheat code is not the famous up up down left <laughs> okay uh i'm not sure about that but i mean that's a possibility uh Presto, I've always tr considered trying to disable to cover up my backup camera to practice driving and parking without one. Yeah, that's another possibility to help you out or just borrow your friend's car that doesn't have a backup camera. That'll help you out too. You Now, there may be some missing information here. If you are taking a driver's test, you can use a backup camera on a driver's test. You just can't use it as your main line of sight, okay? You can't look at the backup camera the whole time. You can't. You need to check your mirrors, check your backup camera, but you need to be looking out through the back window. But you can use a backup camera for a driver's test. And there's a video here on the channel uh, using a backup camera. Corey will put that up for you. Uh, Ray, I did my driving test in my dad's Hyundai Tucson. Done, drove very well. Awesome. And yes, that is a good vehicle for a driver's test. Honda CRV, Toyota Corolla, Honda Civic, uh, Hyundai... Tucson, they're all good vehicles to do your driver's test in. You want a mid-sized vehicle. You don't want something super huge. But there are people who do it in a Dodge 1500. <laughs> uh, and there is a video here on parallel parking a larger vehicle. And uh, that will help you out for those of you in Texas or other places where they drive big vehicles. And you're going to use that for your driver's test. It is possible to do it. It's a little tougher, but you can do it. Uh, Mallory, what was it like in Australia driving on the opposite side of the road? Uh, Mallory, it was good and driving on the other side of the road isn't that difficult because uh, even you're sitting on the other side of the car so relatively speaking everything is in the same place okay you're still relatively sitting in the middle of the road and if you're driving a manual transmission all the pedals are in the same place the only thing that kind of messes you up not so much in cars because the, the, uh, the signals and the windshield wipers are generally in the same place for most personal vehicles. However, in the buses, I was driving coaches there, uh, you would get in the vehicle and the signals and the windshield wipers switches could be on opposite sides of the steering wheel. So you get in one bus and the signals would be on the left as they normally are in most vehicles. And then you would get in another bus and the signals would be on the right. So you go to turn a corner and you flip on the signal or what you thought was the signal and you flip on the windshield wipers and you're like, ah. <laughs> and so it took you a little bit to kind of adjust to that but the only time that i got into trouble in australia driving on the other side of the road was when there wasn't any traffic around early in the morning or i was on a road just like a short residential street or something like that but for the most part it's actually quite easy to drive on the other side of the road the transition is pretty quick um, even for all the miles that i drove driving truck on the right uh, you know it was it's pretty it's a pretty easy transition uh, Rob says, use your backup camera like a tool. Just a quick glance, like how you use your side mirrors. Keep your head on a swivel as you back up uh, primary light, line of sight over your shoulder. Yes, excellent. And uh, keep your seatbelt on. It is the one time when you're reversing, as Rob says. Uh, it is the one time that you can use one hand on the steering wheel. You can put your other arm behind the passenger seat because oftentimes that's more comfortable and it allows you to turn your hips so that you can see out through the back window uh, when you're reversing and you want to be able to do that uh, Presto the only thing with the Tucson's is the mid 2010s have the most notorious theta one uh, That fail prematurely look up the lawsuit on them. Okay, so there's some information for people that have the uh, Tucson's All right, uh, Colton when I take my test It'll be in a either a Toyota Camry or an Audi a5 cabriole 
Crabiole, uh, because the examiner will be able to get in even if with a bad knee or back. Awesome. Yes, and those are two good vehicles to take your driver's test in uh, for sure. Uh, Marion, yeah, and you reach uh, for the gear lever and you hit your hand on the door. Ha ha. <laughs> you didn't do that, did you, Marion? I'm, I'm suspecting that you did. Uh, elevator, I still haven't uh, seen drivers flash their brights at left lane squatters. Uh, yeah, you just, elevator, you come up here to British Columbia and you drive around with Tracy. You'll see left lane squatters getting their lights, <laughs> getting flashed <laughs> by other drivers. That's for sure. That is her pet peeve. That just sends her off the edges. People that sit in that left lane and do not get out of the way. Uh, Epic, in some cases you can use a horn to dissuade a driver from doing an unsafe maneuver. Yes, and you can. And the ways that we communicate, excellent point, Epic, thank you for that. Uh, no, sitting at a green light, road rage, if somebody's sitting there and they're on their phone or they're distracted in some way, you can tap the horn. Meep, meep, and just say, hey, <laughs> the light changed, we can go here. That is not seen as a sign of aggression. So the way that we communicate with other traffic, as I was talking about, Position of the road user on the roadway, so the position of the vehicle. If the driver is in, has the vehicle position in the left turn lane, there's a high probability that they're going to turn left. If there's a pedestrian at a crosswalk, there's a high probability that that pedestrian is going to cross the street at the crosswalk. Position of the road user, uh, variation in speed, where the vehicle is positioned in the lane. If they're moving towards the right side of the lane and there's a turning, there's an intersection and a slip lane in front of them, there's a good possibility that they're going to turn right. So try to interpret the movement and change in speed of other vehicles and road users and also be, begin to try and understand the relative speeds of different road user groups. So pedestrians are walking at five or six miles an hour. You are driving your car in the city at approximately 30 miles an hour. So there's a speed differential there of about 24 miles an hour, which is going to be a big speed differential so you're going to gain on pedestrians even more. Now, if you watch all the traffic safety authorities and every one of them is saying the same thing over and over and over again, because one of the things that people do who don't really know is they repeat something ad nauseum until they get other people to believe that it's true. They keep saying speed, 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 speed is a problem, 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 speed is a problem. Speed is not the problem, okay? Because speed was the problem, we would have way more crashes on our highways than in our cities. And it is actually the inverse. Speed is not the problem. Our ability to main, maintain space around our vehicle is the problem. That's why we get into crashes. Because we're too close to other people. We're too close to fixed objects along the roadway. Control space around your vehicle and that will keep you safe on the roadways. All right, so the first way, position of the vehicle, position of the road user, lights and signals is the other way that we communicate, and then eye contact, hand gestures, and then finally use the horn. Use the horn sparingly because in this day and age in North America, it's seen as a sign of aggression. So if you do need to use the horn, light tap, meep, meep, and that will communicate to other people what you're doing. Uh, Klaus, I know about 20 minutes ago, I saw some blue lights blinking in my room. Uh, fire truck goes by like 60 kilometers an hour in a 30 zone. So yes, they're moving. <laughs> uh, Presto says the car that I drive now is 311 horsepower, 3.8 V6. Yes, and that's not uncommon. I mean, two 300 horsepower is pretty standard fare now for most vehicles coming off the line. You don't even have to do anything uh, to have that kind of horsepower in your vehicle. Uh, I know that Tracy's Audi V6 supercharged and I almost positive it has a chip in it like it has a tune uh, what they call it a euro tune uh because the v6 supercharge comes at 333 horsepower and you can get a euro chip or a euro euro tune done to it and it puts it up to what 400 horsepower that thing is just crazy crazy fast crazy fast uh 3po i bought wheel locks the other day just in case honda's rim replacements can reach the thousands and i don't think the warranty covers it uh, but it would, 3PO, uh, it might be covered under your insurance or you could get insurance company coverage for your rims. But if you're, like you said, if you're parking outside somewhere, then yeah, that might uh, help you out for sure. Uh, Colton, I was talking about the train ship horn idea, okay. Uh, 
Elevator fan, why do left lane squatters sit in the left lane? Uh, why do left lane squatters sit in the left lane? I think it has to do with people tuning it out. They're hitting and quitting it. They get on the highway, they sit in the left lane, and for a majority of them, they think that they have the right to sit in the left lane. They don't have to get out of the left lane. It's part of North American driving culture that they can get in that left lane and they can sit in that left lane indefinitely and they don't have to move out of the lane. And I think if more people started giving them grief, flashing the lights, honking the horn, tailgating them, then they might start to get the message that it's time to start moving out of that left lane and not sit there and squat. Now, driving up and down Highway 97 here between Vernon and Kelowna in the last few weeks, I have noticed that more and more people are moving over because I tend to be somebody who drives in the left lane because I like to drive fast and I drive right at this traffic flow uh, and it's posted 90 kilometers an hour but the traffic flow up and down there is all day long is 110 kilometers an hour which is so the posted speed limit is 55 miles an hour uh, people drive up there at 70 miles an hour all day long and uh, basically when you're driving 70 miles an hour you don't have to get out of that left lane and but I'm always watching in the in the mirrors and making sure that uh, uh, you know, there's people coming up behind me. If there's people coming up behind me, then I just get over to the right lane and let them pass. And oftentimes I'll move over even if I have to slow down if I see other people driving faster than me. And exactly, there's the other point of what Tim just said as well, is, is that a lot of times the left lane's open. There's nobody in it, right? So, uh, you know, they're not really paying attention to what's going on around them. Uh, Mary and I have seen driving teachers telling them to drive in the left lane. Even my teacher told me I should drive in the left lane. <laughs> uh, I dare not speak ill about my industry. Yes, unfortunately, people have opinions about driving. As I said to you, the comment of the person the other day said that if you leave space around your vehicle, you're not using the road to capacity. Uh, and nothing is further from the truth. It's exactly the opposite of that. If we leave more space around our vehicles, we're going to alleviate congestion. We're going to have more vehicles per hour moving through a section of roadway. But you cannot convince people of that. You cannot convince people of that. And uh, Marion, the other thing, when I was driving all the time, I'd get my truck driving students and you would have to repeat ad nauseum again and again and again. Get over in the other lane. Get over in the other <laughs> you know, and, you know, finally, after a bit, they would finally get on to the fact that they actually had to drive in the right-hand lane. Uh, Klaus, about three weeks, a driver managed to split his car in two parts. The tree was stronger. 42 uh, are in heaven now. Uh, that's unfortunate. Yes, and uh, never go for a tree. If you have the choice between a hedge and a tree, don't go for the tree because the tree is going to win every time. Trees do not move. And uh, yeah. Uh, potholes in the right lane, pothole season policy. Yes. <laughs> That's another theory on it as well, Rob. Thank you for that. That people are driving in the left hand lane to avoid potholes. I know we have some pretty serious potholes uh, in the right hand lane. You know, I drive up and down that section of roadway all the time. So I know where all the potholes are and I'm always moving around them. And, uh, you know, the, the buggy is nimble enough and small enough that it's pretty easy to avoid the part, the, the potholes. Uh, Black Eyed Susie, how do you park on an icy sloped road in a city? Uh, how do you park on an icy sloped road in the city? Okay, so first of all, if it's like super icy Susie, you probably shouldn't be out driving. And if you're going to park, uh, the only way to do it is to make sure that you get your wheels the right way so that you can get your wheels into the curb so that you can have some other way of holding the vehicle in case you can't the tires are not getting enough traction to be able to hold the vehicle when you park it there okay so all the other things apply you know parking brake on wheels against the curb and then you can park it in those types of things uh 3po i was looking at a Lamborghini Huracan and it was like 750 horsepower I'd rather buy a house <laughs> yeah well uh, that's the thing 3PO you don't need a, a Lamborghini to get 750 horsepower now I mean some of the Corvettes the Mustangs the Camaros uh, some of these vehicles you can get the high-end ones that are now coming off the line with that kind of horsepower 750 a thousand horsepower and these vehicles that are special order that are that much horsepower when you're talking 750 horsepower to 1,000 horsepower, uh, they now have specialty courses, high-speed driving courses that you have to take before you can actually drive the vehicle home. Because 
my brother was telling me, I don't know whether this is true. I haven't confirmed this information. However, most of these drivers who go and pick up their vehicles and they're just crazy stupid horsepower, like 700 horsepower, uh, usually they're not making it home. They're usually getting into a crash before they get home because they just don't know how to drive uh, with that kind of horsepower. Uh, Ray, the beauty of living up north, having potholes capable of destroying your tires and suspension. And yes, uh, you could bury a small horse in it. Uh, they're that big for sure. I've seen those. Uh, Colton, it's best to intimidate Jeff Gordon. Those guys are pros. Uh, yes, but not on the highways. You don't want to be driving like a NASCAR driving out on the roadways for sure. <laughs> no. Uh, Presto, is there a video about parking without a backup camera? Yes, there is a video. Uh, with backing without a backup. Actually, I sure I had to do it in the buggy. Corey will put that video up for you as well, and that'll help you out. Uh, okay, close. About three weeks, the driver manages to split. Okay, we already had that comment. Uh, yeah, we're all caught up here. Excellent. Eminem, you are most welcome, my friend. If we can definitely help you out, that's always awesome, my friend. All right, so defensive driving. Okay, what is the problem of defensive driving? What is the problem of driving that we're dealing with that we're trying to be proactive drivers? So social driving, people don't come to a complete stop at stop sign intersections. They follow too close. They fail to signal. Uh, they drive over painted islands. They uh, speed up going through yellow traffic lights. Yada, yada, yada. The list is endless about social driving and what people do. How do you keep yourself safe? Okay, these two skills. If you can practice these two skills, it's going to keep you safe on the roadways, all right? Okay, maintain a three to four second following distance at all times. The only time that you should be using the brake when you're driving is slowing down for vehicles that are turning in front of you or you're going to turn, coming to a stop, unexpected events, or controlling your speed on a downhill. Those are the only four times that you should be using the brake. Now that's an ideal, okay? You should be controlling space in front of your vehicle using the throttle. You can do that. Not only are you gonna get better fuel economy, but you're significantly going to reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Stopping in traffic at a stop sign intersection or behind a queue of traffic, one vehicle length, okay? And you should your landmark for that is to be able to see the tires of the vehicle in front making clear contact with the pavement. Okay, if you can do those two things, maintain that space in front of your vehicle, that's going to keep you safe when you're driving and significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. And it's not easy. It's incredibly difficult to do those two things because everything in the driving environment is telling you to be uptight against the vehicle in front of you. And you need to resist that urge to drive like everybody else because we're herd animals. We wanna do what everybody else is doing. But proactive driving, keeping yourself safe, is not doing what everybody else does. All right? Uh, Klaus, if you hit it and quit it, please, on the Nuremberg racetrack. Yeah, not on a racetrack either. Uh, Chris, is it possible to change examiners on a road test in New York City? It's important. Uh, okay, so Chris, did you already have a driver's test? You failed and you don't want the same driving examiner? I will tell you right now, for everybody taking a driver's test, if you failed your driver's test, it's really unlikely that you're gonna have the same driving examiner again. They will assign you a different driving examiner for you to take another test, okay? They will not give you the same driving examiner. I don't think in all the years that I drove and I had students who had failed a driver's test, did they ever have the same driving examiner. It might happen if you're in a small, really small driving test center and they don't have very many examiners? Yes, okay, so it's unlikely they're gonna sign you the same examiner. They'll probably, they'll give you another driving examiner to retake your test, okay? I've never, in all my years of driving, any time that I took a student back to do a retest, it's always been a different examiner, okay? Uh, Colton, the track has made uh, test endurance of a car more than speed. Awesome. Uh, Mallory, when you were getting onto the highway, do you stop on an acceleration lane? Absolutely not, Mallory. You know my feelings about this. Okay, get your foot into it, get it going, match highway speed, find your spot, and aim for that spot on the highway to keep yourself safe. Uh, Susie, as a new driver, how do you get good at navigating roundabouts? Uh, Susie, practice, practice, practice. Now, if you're having difficulty, with roundabouts, Corey will put the video up for you to have a look at. And as well, like the four-way stops, go down, 
stand at the four, at the roundabout and watch traffic move through the intersection, okay? At roundabouts, you have to give way to the vehicles in the roundabout, okay? Uh, <laughs> yes, 3PO. It is one of the places that you can pretend it's a racetrack for sure on the acceleration lane. All right, so we're going to leave it there for tonight. Uh, puppy time. I'll just grab the puppy here in just a moment here and we'll have a look. Striker. Are you having a nap? Come on. Wake up. Here we go. Up. Come and say hi. <laughs> he was having a sleep. That's why he's got a funny look on his face. Can you say hi? You're like, what? I was having a nap. Dad, come on. Leave me alone. Yeah, he's not so much a puppy now. He's getting pretty big. He's probably about 20 pounds. But he's got that funny look on his face because he was having a nap. He's just like, Dad, just leave me alone. Dad, just leave me alone. <laughs> so this is Striker. For those of you who haven't met Striker before, uh, he is the smart drive test puppy dog. All right. And uh, we're going to take off here because we've got to go get my son from soccer. So all the best. Thank you so much for the great live stream. Just absolutely awesome questions and comments. Uh, if you passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations. Awesome, awesome work. Uh, check out Pastor Driver's Test First Time Course Package over at the Smart Drive Test website. And if you have a test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.